Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hope you're doing well. We are continuing our reading of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab's Removal of Doubts book. It has really gone into what is shirk and essentially tawhid, right? Islamic monotheism. So we'll continue upon that note. It is a wonderful gray rainy morning and that is the perfect reading weather for me. Let's begin. Bismillah. Then, if he says, do you reject the intercession of the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, and have you forsaken it? Say to him, I do not reject it, nor have I abandoned it, but rather he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is the intercessor whose intercession will be sought and granted, and I truly hope for his intercession. But all intercession is for Allah, as he, as Sawajal, says. To Allah belongs all intercession. Surah al-Zumir 39, 44. So, we will acknowledge, I get from this, that the Prophet, peace be upon him, can intercede for us. We can hope that Allah grants it. Right for us, but you cannot just pray directly to the Prophet, peace be upon him. His statement, then, if he says, means if the polytheist with doubt says to you, Do you reject the intercession of the Prophet, peace be upon him? He only says this in order to attempt to compel you to state the permissibility of supplicating to the Prophet, peace be upon him, in the hope that he might intercede for you with Allah if you call upon him. So say to him, I do not reject this intercession, nor do I deny it, but I do say, however, that the intercession is for Allah, and it returns entirely to him, and he is the one to permit it if he so wills to whomever he wills, because he said, say to Allah belongs all intercession, for him is the dominion of the heavens and the earth. Surah al-Zumar 39, 44. So it's quite clear then for us. You just have to use your reasoning. If someone tries to tell you, what I get from this is that, oh, you can pray directly to the Prophet. You're like, no, nope, that's shirk, because... All acts of worship have to be towards Allah. And if you invoke anything other than Allah, that's shirk. So it's clear cut if you follow the simple logic. And it will not occur except with Allah's permission. As he says, Who is it that can intercede with him except by his permission? Surah Al-Baqarah 2. 255. Okay, so we have another one here. Another ayat here. So I think that's uh, who continues to pay his permission. I think that's Ayatul uh, Kursi, right? So, right now we had two ayats that hit directly to the point. And he will not intercede on anyone's behalf until Allah has permitted him, as Allah as says, and they cannot intercede except for one with whom he is pleased. Surah Al Anbiya 21 28. Okay, so notice here. They cannot intercede except. So if Allah is not pleased with that person with whom He is pleased, you can't just override Allah's will. And He is not pleased with anything other than Tawheed. As Allah Aswajal says, whoever desires other than Islam as a religion, then this will not be accepted from him. Surah Ali Imran 3.85 This is another one that I find very important. You'll see some people who... They try to be a theosophist. They blend different religious creeds together and then make their own path. And they will be like, this is why I don't like religion, or I won't be part of your religion because this, this, and that. But I like this, this aspect of it. And then they'll take from different 
creeds and philosophies and create their own path, right? And for us Muslims, we don't contend that if you are some strange heathen pagan, you know, that you're suddenly going to go to Islamic paradise. This is the complexities of, was that person ever introduced to Islam? Versus, did the message come to you and you denied it? And you died upon shirk? Are there some Christians and Jays who will be let in because they actually believed in Allah and they didn't commit shirk? These are a lot of questions, right? But what is clear is that what is Allah going to accept? Right. So if someone says, "Oh, you guys think you're so special, as Muslims, that you're going to go to paradise?" You'll be. Some people will be punished in hell and let out. Some will go straight to paradise. But being a Muslim, obviously, Allah doesn't like the kafir. So being a Muslim obviously puts you in more good graces with the Creator, Sustainer of all, and He'll be more accepting of what a Muslim does than a polytheist. I mean, you just the natural reasoning of the whole thing. His statement, and it will not occur except with Allah's permission, clarifies that intercession does not occur except that two conditions have been fulfilled. Okay, so intercession does not occur except via these two conditions. The first one is that Allah permits it, which is supported by His saying, who is it that can intercede with him except by his permission? Surah so Al-Baqarah 2, 255. The second condition. That Allah is pleased with the intercessor. And for the one whom intercession is sought, which is supported by his statement. That day, no intercession will benefit anyone except for the one to whom the Most Merciful has given permission. And has accepted his word. Surah Taha 2109. So here, if Allah can make someone's intercession not benefit them, that shows you that He has the ultimate control. Alright, so an angel, you're like, oh, I'm going to talk to this angel. Uh, a jinn gave me a name of an angel, and I'm going to invoke that angel, and that angel's going to do this and this for me. It's just not going to work like that. It's not. It's not how it works. Mary was a human. She doesn't have, she's not a demigod, she's not a goddess. Okay? She doesn't have the ability to, she's, she's a created being. Okay? She, she, she can't decide what happens to you. Same with Musa, Ibrahim, all of Noah, Adam. No one can come to your aid unless Allah grants it. And he said, and they cannot intercede except for one with whom he is pleased. Surah Al Anbiya 21 28. So, very clear. It is well known that Allah is the only one pleased with Islamic monotheism, Tawheed, and it is not possible that he would be pleased with disbelief. As he says, if you disbelieved, no, sorry. If you disbelieve, indeed, Allah is free from needing of you, and He does not approve disbelief for His servants. And if you are grateful, He is pleased with this from you. Surah Al-Zumar 39.7 So if He is not pleased with disbelief, then He would not permit the intercessor of a disbeliever. Ooh, that's a great logic right there. Wow. Right on the head, right in there. So if all intercession is for Allah, and this will only occur after He has first permitted it, and neither the Prophet nor anyone else can intercede on behalf of anyone unless Allah permits, and since he does not permit this, except for the people of Tawheed, it should become clear that all intercession is for Allah. 
so seek it from him. Okay, so here. The people of Tawheed. And then it should become clear that all intercession is for Allah, so seek it from him. Exactly. So he has proven Allah has the final say. So we would be doing ourselves a disservice by artificially doing a middleman. Right? We don't have to go to the Pope. You know, we don't say, hey, Pope, pray for me in, in a way that commits shirk. Right? Now, I think if you would like to say in your prayer, oh, Allah, please let someone intercede uh, for me and, and, and like vouch for me or something on Judgment Day, there's a wording that's okay because you asked Allah first. Allah, please grant permission to so and so. It's not, oh, Prophet Noah, let me get to Jan al Fardos. You see what I'm saying? No, you can't do that. You cannot do that. So I say, oh, Allah, do not deprive me of his intercession. Okay, so he gave us an example here. Oh, Allah, do not deprive me of his intercession. Oh, Allah, let him intercede on my behalf and whatever is similar to this. Okay, perfect. But if he says, the Prophet ﷺ was granted the intercession and I seek it from the one it was given to. Aha, see, so some would, he's, they're contending that some people will say, well, since the Prophet peace be upon him is going to be allowed to intercede for us, it therefore then means we can pray to him directly. But the Prophet, as it was laid out in the Quran, is a human, right? Everything else is created. You can't pray to anything in creation. And du'a is prayer. Du'a is a form of worship. See the connection? So with his statement, so if all intercession is for Allah, the author intends to establish that if all intercession is for Allah and does not occur except with his permission, and since it will not happen except for a person with whom Allah is pleased. And similarly, since Allah is only pleased with Islamic monotheism, Tawheed, then it is unavoidable. Then it is an unavoidable conclusion that one must not seek the intercession except from Allah. Okay, so notice here. Allah is only pleased with Islamic monotheism, Tawheed. You have to get that right. One must not seek the intercession except from Allah Asawajal and not from the Prophet. So he should say, O oh Allah, accept the intercession of your Prophet concerning me and do not forbid me from his intercession. Or whatever may be similar to this. So here we go. We've given, he's given, sorry, two examples here. Two du'as we can say in our prayers that are safe and sound and don't commit shark. His statement, but he, if he says, refers to the polytheist who supplicates to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and says that certainly Allah has given Muhammad, peace be upon him, the intercession. So I will seek it from the one whom it was given to. So this is really clear cut. Christians have this dilemma of is Jesus literally God or is Jesus the son of God? Because you can't be the son of yourself. Okay, that's what? That's a very strange thing. How can you be God and then God needing to go inside the womb of a woman? A woman was carrying God in her womb, Mary, and God had to come out and be birthed in a barn. The one who created Mary in the first place, the one who s simply had to s tell Adam be, and it, and he was. The one who let Hawa Eve come from Adam's rib. You see what I'm saying? It, that's just. Puts a lot of 
pressure on Mary. She carried God in her womb. You know, you have to be careful of that. And so when people say, in the name of Jesus, instead of saying, O oh, Jehovah, O oh, Yahweh, O oh, God, right? Oh, because if the Holy Spirit, Jesus, and God are the same, why don't why doesn't anyone say, "Oh, Holy Spirit, this"? And then when you see them say, "Holy Spirit, this, Jesus, that, God, that," now we're getting into, okay, what's going on? See, Allah has names, but these are attributes, and they are not entities in and of their own, right? You can call upon Allah as the sustainer, but that's not the same thing as when Catholics call upon God as the Holy Spirit. You see? It's real different. So, we don't turn Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, like the Christians do. So, we have to watch out for that. We have to make sure no human... No one who dies, no one who was created, is invoked. Which necessarily then infers that the only thing left is Allah alone. Because Allah is the only thing in creation that wasn't created. And no one can escape His will. He has the final say. He's one in His Lordship. And that then shows you that your worship is for the one who controls everything and has the firm hold on everything under his dominion, which is everything. Makes more sense to me, this purest form of monotheism, in my opinion. Okay. I'll pause here, because this will go on into another one. And... Uh, it talks more about intercession but gives three points and I want to pause because it would be better to leave this part for next time. I hope you learned something. I know I did. And this would be a great book for people trying to get away from worshipping saints. People who are severely attached to statuaries as some form of totems. Stuff like that. It's fantastic when you see the purity of Islamic monotheism. There is nothing like it. There's no sprites in the forest, no fairies. Nothing like that for us. No shapeshifters. None of that. None of this weird stuff we got going on today. No Anunnaki. None of that. It's really freeing. It's really freeing once you get rid of this inclination towards shrines. Like I went past a taqueria the other day with my children and they had a little mini altar shrine thing of the Virgin of Guadalupe with the candles and the stuff and you're like, they literally think that by having that in their restaurant, their business will be blessed. And that if they don't have it, then they won't get as many customers and stuff. Whereas us Muslims, we don't need no shrine. We simply need to ask Allah to give our work barakah and do good deeds. And if Allah grants it, He grants it. But we don't need to light these candles and put little trinkets and have an image of the Virgin of Guadalupe. Sometimes they have both the Virgin of Guadalupe and the Virgin Mary. We, we don't need that. We don't need that. And they don't... They don't even know if that's what she really looked like, right? It's it's wild to me. Wild, absolutely wild. So, keep that clear. They're doing an act of shirk by just having that altar alone because they turn to her instead of God, right? Think about it. Um, we are definitely blessed to be part of the fold of Islam. Definitely. If you'd like to support my content, you can do so via the blog and also read my longer posts and refutations. And I do all kinds of stuff on there. You're just searching through tags and you'll find something you like, most likely, inshallah. 
and that is www.subscribestar.com slash Milhan Archive. Hope to see you there.